really honoured to open the third Lincoln Leeds series this evening. It's now the 17th Lincoln Leeds panel, which means that we've totaled over 50 guest speakers, a real testament to the amount of expertise that is fostered through Lincoln College. Thank you all for coming tonight to this very timely panel on Brexit means Brexit, but what does that mean for UK trade law? Of course, we have learned this week that Brexit does not necessarily mean Brexit. In fact, whilst I think all of us, regardless of how we voted in the referendum, once hoped that a meaningful vote might actually provide some clarity and direction, instead we are left in the disorientation that the word Brexit does not currently mean anything. So what that means for UK trade law, I have no idea. <laughs> and on that note, good luck to our panellists. <laughs> I mean, we all have attended on the promise of you providing us with uh, the clarity that we also dearly desire. But we are in luck, ladies and gentlemen, as we have on our panel tonight three very impressive speakers. Speaking first, we have Professor Stefan Enkelmeyer a fellow at Lincoln College and a professor of European and Comparative Law. He is an expert on constitutional and procedural aspects of European Union law, but handily, his current research focuses on Brexit and the European Union's internal market, especially the customs union and all questions regarding free movement. Speaking next, we have Lincoln alumnus Lee Rowley MP. As all great Lincolnites do, Lee read modern history at Lincoln, <laughs> matriculating in 1999. Lee is now the Member of Parliament for North East Derbyshire, elected in June 2017, as the first Conservative MP for the constituency since 1935, and a seat where 63% of people voted Leave. In case you haven't already Googled it, Lee voted against May's deal on Tuesday, and as a committed Brexiteer, app, he is particularly adept to speak on, uh, on trade and Brexit, particularly as he sits on the Public Accounts Select Committee and is co-chair of the Freer Initiative, promoting social and economic liberalism. And finally, we have our MCR member, Samuel Murray, who is here in Lincoln on a leave of absence from Cause Chambers Westgarth, a leading Australian law firm, to study the Bachelor of Civil Law. After graduating from the University of Sydney in 2015, Samuel served as a tip staff for two judges on the New South Wales Court of Appeal. From 2017, he was a commercial litigation solicitor for cause, and in 2018, Samuel won the New South Wales Young Lawyer of the Year Award for his, uh, for his work, and he is currently a recipient uh, sorry, a recipient of the Banking and Financial Services Law Association of Australia and New Zealand Scholarship. Um, so, hopefully we will all be enlightened tonight. And without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, <coughs> Stefan Enkelmeyer, to talk. Thank you very much, Ella. Um, when it comes to the question, what will the effects of Brexit be on UK trade law, I must admit, I have no idea. <laughs> and that's why I propose to approach the subject uh, a little more fundamentally to illustrate why I think that's a useful exercise. Let me read a small passage from this book here, Fallout by Tim Shipman, on account of the uh, 2017 election to you. Uh, and uh, the scene is the dinner between uh, a commission president, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, and the Prime Minister uh, May in uh, the run-up to the 2017 election. When May enjoyed her guests, let make, let's make Brexit a success. Juncker points to Britain's planned withdrawal from the single market and the customs union and said, Britain cannot be a success. When the Commission President pointed out that Britain would become a third country state at the point of Brexit, further outside the customs union even than Turkey, May seemed surprised giving rise to concerns that she was not fully briefed. So there we go. Um, I propose to give you a little bit of a briefing. To that end, uh, you find on your seats uh, one of those tables that my students get to see ad nauseum. There it is. Yeah. Um, let's approach it from the left. The two 
fundamental principles of the internal market. That's what we see there. It's the internal market. That's the regulatory scheme that governs the internal market. There's lots of loyalist stuff in there. Let's not get sidetracked. Let me briefly walk you through it. In the very left, uh, written from the bottom to the top, uh, it lists the two general, the, the two pillars on which the internal market rests. There's a general prohibition of discrimination based on nationality, Article 18. All article numbers are treaty on the functioning of the European Union. That's the former EEC treaty following the Lisbon Amendment. And secondly, there's the uh, idea of an area without internal frontiers to the free movement of. And now we're in the left-hand column. There you see the four freedoms. Goods, persons, in itself subdivided, services, and capital. Now it gets ever more general. Negative integration are prohibitions addressed to the member states. In that column you see the treaty articles uh, which establish the internal market. That's the core of European economic law. Um, these prohibitions all come with exceptions. That's the middle column. The exceptions are none other than grounds which the member states may invoke to justify suitable and necessary restrictions. So all the public interests that the member states are allowed to pursue um, when they become member states. And then lastly, um, there's a column called positive integration. Positive not because everybody necessarily likes it, but because here legislation is put in place, Latin polera. And there you see the legal basis uh, on which the European Union can bring about harmonization in the internal market, with the emphasis on can. There's no automatism whatsoever. But this is not um, primarily a class on uh, these questions. What we need is the first row on top. Let's look at Article 30. Article 30 prohibits customs duties uh, and charges having an equivalent effect. Again, not a law class, doesn't matter what they are. Exceptions, none. Why? The European Union is a free trade area, it has a common external tariff, and it abolishes non-tariff barriers between member states, and all of this together makes the internal market. And that's where I take off. I brought my own whiteboard markers. Lincoln has um, everything in abundance that one could hope for in an academic environment except functioning whiteboard markets. <laughs> so here are my own. I hope you can see this from where you're sitting. Let me move it a bit over there. Here we have four countries in a fictitious region of the world. Let's call it Europe. <laughs> <laughs> These countries think about um, integrating their economies for their mutual benefit. And here comes the first step that they can take on their way to economic integration. They can create a free trade area. Trade always means trade in tangible, movable goods, tangible, movable items or chattels. Such as, let's draw one now, it gets in areas. <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay, I know, I know. <laughs> that's a car. You guess this much. Oh, it has wheels as well. <laughs> okay, so here's a car. Um, let's just um, stick with the car. So, A, B, C, and D, our new member states, want to create a free trade area. What do they do? Uh, what makes it into a free trade area? They abolish two things. One is customs duties, Article 30. Customs duties are amounts of money that you have to pay to be allowed to import your products into a particular country. And then there's another thing that they abolish, namely quota, or in technical speak, quantitative restrictions. That's the first alternative in Article 34. So, no more restrictions on cars moving from A into B, from B into C, and from D into A, in any direction. Not all of these countries will have their own car industries, and that's, before they, that's why before they abolish the customs duties, let's presume A has a tariff of 5%, B has a tariff of 10%, D has 
5% as well, C has 0%. Why is that? Because they will want to protect whatever car industry they have already against competition from abroad. Tech B, our guess is, has a, a car industry. Uh, a and B might have one as well. And C, we can guess, has none. It wants to make sure that its nationals can get their hands on cars cheaply, unencumbered, not artificially made more expensive through customs duty. So the customs duties now disappear. We all move to zero, and there's also no more upper limit as to the number of cars that can be brought into the country. So we end up with zero, they already have zero, it goes to zero here, and zero here. You already noticed that there are political implications, because the level of customs duties will be fixed in accordance with the industrial policy of the individual participants. Okay, so far so good. Now, cars made in any one of those countries can circulate freely among the four. Notice that the promise, I will not hassle your cars with customs duties and quantitative restrictions, is good only between our four countries here. And that means we need to know whenever a consignment of cars rocks up at the border of B or C or D, any of the member states, whether these cars benefit from the promise that these, com that these countries have made to one another. In other words, we have to establish whether a particular car is made in one of the participating countries. Or to put it differently, we need rules of origin. Rules of origin. How do we know whether a car comes from one of the participating countries? The answer is border controls. We check. We check where a car comes from. If a car that arrives at the border of B turns out to be a car that was made in A, it can come in for free, no customs duties. If it turns out that it's a car made in U, it will have to pay 10% customs duties. So here is the first limitation to how free trade can get in a free trade area. The promise of free trade is made only among the participants. We still need to check the origin of products that turn up at the borders because third countries, such as U and C, don't benefit from it. There's also another reason why we need to check because vis-a-vis uh, -vis A, B, C and D, each of those levies 0% now and any number of cars can come in made in those countries but that's not true of cars made in U and in C. As things stand, U will try to import its cars into C first in the hope that they can then sneak into A, B, and D. Here's another reason why every free trade area needs border controls. All of these border controls mean hassle, bureaucracy, expense. That's why the next step up from a customs union, from, from a free trade area, is a customs union. The problem they have here, the need for these controls that we've seen so far, is triggered by the existence of independent trade policies vis-a-vis -vis third countries. B is perfectly free vis-a-vis -vis U and C, or oh, this actually has to be, let's call it CH, because we have a C, of course, as a member state here. B is perfectly free, remains perfectly free before as after to levy the 10% that it used to. All of the controls that are triggered by this can be abolished in one fell swoop if all of these countries promise to one, promise one another, agree with one another, that they will all charge the same customs duties vis-a-vis -vis the wider world. Then they have a customs union. Around their territory, around Europe now, there is a common customs tariff. That abolishes the need for border controls uh, based to police uh, customs duties and um, quantitative restrictions. One last point, and now we come to the last level. This car here now benefits in that it can come in for free and in any number, but of course as a car it has all sorts of technical uh, provisions attached to it, emissions, safety, um, uh, all sorts of other features 
will be the subject of all sorts of rules in the different member states. In order to make sure that a car that comes from A into B is safe to be released onto uh, the public roads in B, B will want to check the, um, these, technological, these, these technologies that went into the car. We are then talking about not fiscal barriers to trade, we're talking about non-tariff non barriers. Now the non-tariff barriers, they still necessitate border controls. If you want to get rid of the non-tariff barriers, you can do two things which we actually see in the European Union. You can run a system of so-called mutual recognition. A car that is safe enough in A is deemed to be safe enough in B, C and D unless B, C, and D can muster good reasons for why they think that it isn't safe. And that remains their quality prerogative. They can still do that. If any restrictions survive, if any restrictions are maintained afterwards, then the countries might think about adopting harmonized standards so that a car that is made in accordance with these harmonized standards in A, B, C, and D can be traded without any further need for controls in any one of those countries. And then we've reached the third stage, namely an internal market. So, to recap, customs union, uh, free trade area means the abolition of customs duties and quantitative restrictions. No more money to be paid to get in, no more cap on how much can come in. That still requires border controls because it leaves member states free to pursue independent trade policies vis a vis third countries. The member states to the free trade area can then decide to do away with the need for controls um, of, in particular, the origin of products by adopting a common customs tariff. They have then created, they have then created a customs union. Notice that with each step, the need for policy coordination becomes greater. At that point, we have abolished the need for border controls in order to police rules of origin, but we have not yet overcome the non-tariff barriers which flow from the different technical standards in the member states. If they want to have truly free trade, then they have to do something about these and the solutions that we find around the world, but uh, really there's only one internal market, that's the one uh, in the European Union. Then they have to uh, operate a system of mutual recognition combined with selective harmonization. And that's the system that we have. Um, just like Port Theresa May had not been briefed on what a customs union is, I hope you will in the future understand that these are three different steps and three different things. Free trade area, customs union, internal market. The confusion comes from the fact that the European Union is all three. There is no other area in the world where the economic integration between the participating countries has progressed so far. That's why Sometimes people find it difficult to tell the three apart. I hope you won't anymore. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Lee Rowley, I'm the MP for North East Derbyshire. Um, thank you very much to Stefan for that. Um, I'm, I don't have a diagram like that, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid, so I'll disappoint you right now. I'm also going to disappoint you because uh, I am neither an expert in trade or law. I'm a historian, as was announced prior to this, so I'm going to use the politician's get out of talking slightly more broadly about this. So if there are any questions about the details and intricacies of trade law, I'm going to be directing them to the other panellists rather than myself. But I thought what would be helpful would be to try and ask, uh, put some context on where we are, particularly from my angle as a Brexiteer. Uh, representing a very heavily leaf seat in the Midlands, which is also the seat I was born and grew up in before I came up to Lincoln in 1999, and then just talk about the implications as I see it for trade. So the question that was posited at the beginning was, what does Brexit mean? And I, uh, like Stefan, I think there's a question about whether people actually know that at the moment. Uh, uh, I can tell you, though, quite definitively, I don't think Brexit for many people means what that 585 page document which I brought as a comfort blanket and is currently sat on, uh, on the desk over there. I don't think it means that. And I don't think it means that for both people who uh, either are not reconciled to leave, of which there are a large number in this country, or those people who are reconciled to leave but who potentially don't think it's the correct thing to do. And it's certainly not the ideal or even necessarily the acceptable for many of us who are more robust on this than others, including myself. When you stand back on Brexit, uh, 
I assume, I mean, how many people are just bored at Brexit and want to go and talk about other stuff? Nurses, schools, you know, normal things that we used to talk about in politics. I, uh, to some extent, I, I, I am as well. The challenge with that, however, when I go down to Parliament every, every week, I go on a Sunday and I come back on a Wednesday or a Thursday, is that Brexit has consumed Parliament. 95% plus of our discussions in the House of Commons is on Brexit. You could find the most non-related subject to Brexit, and I guarantee you that within the discussion, we will talk about what the Brexit implications are for it. And I'm afraid I think we've gone slightly mad down there. And I don't think it's helping. I think there is a, there is a weird concoction of politicians obsessing about Brexit, the media being very excited about that obsession, and then we're working ourselves up into a pressure cooker here. That isn't to diminish the importance of this, it isn't to minimise the detail which needs to be gone through, and it isn't to suggest that there aren't some fundamental concepts here that need to be debated, but I think the place where we've got to in this country is a really worrying one, and we all need to stand back and say, is this the right place to be, irrespective of our own individual views on Brexit. And I say that because fundamentally, if we stand back, has anything much changed on Brexit for much of the last year? And you know, you can look in the last week, you know, in some ways everything has changed and nothing has changed. Because in the last week alone, we have had a withdrawal agreement which came back for the second time after being pulled in an unprecedented way, and then went down to the most historic defeat going, of which my party split in the largest way probably in living memory, and then we had a no confidence vote, which weirdly ended up by the end of yesterday probably uniting the Conservative Party for more than it's done in most of the last six months. So in some ways it is the most incredible time, but also the fundamentals of Brexit have not changed in my view for the best part of a year. Uh, they changed last in July, last year, when the Prime Minister did a clear pivot from what she had been saying pre prior to that, and which I was supporting her prior to that on. And then they sort of semi-changed in November, but November was effectively an extension of checkers. Checkers was the groundwork for November. So we almost have to sort of stand back and see the wood for the trees. The static nature of the debate, however, slightly belies the, import, uh, the, the element of trade, which is what we're talking about today. Interestingly, over the past few months, the importance and the salience of trade and international trade has sort of diminished somewhat within the overall debate on Brexit. And that's an interesting thing in itself because I actually think the trade element is much more important than everything else in it as a non-expert, non-lawyer uh, uh, and the like. And we have got fixated on the backstop. Now the backstop of the trade, trade international trade and, 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 and agreements are, are inextricably linked. We've got fixated on the backstop, and I think we've got fixated on the backstop because the backstop is more easy to understand and more uh, articulatable, it's not obviously not a lot articulable, uh, uh, than, than trade. I think, I think the media and the politicians had a go at trying to bring trade to the fore after checklists, common rule book, things like that. And then actually we realised it wasn't very easy to, to talk about, and the backstop is a much more easier thing for the media to talk about. You know, you can go to the Northern Irish border, you can talk about these things, you can physically see it, whereas trade is a little bit more um, conceptual. Um, so that's an interesting point. The second, the only other thing that's really changed in the last six to nine months is the, is the resilience of the individual parties when they're debating this. You have a series of parties that have sort of reconciled their position. You have a series of parties who have tried to reconcile their position and sort of split on this position. And then you've got one party who hasn't yet reconciled its position. So the first group are the Lib Dems, the Greens, the Nats. They, are clear, they have clearly come to a place where 95% of people uh, in that party agree with what they want to see out of Brexit. Usually they don't want Brexit to happen, and if it must happen, what they need to see out of it. Uh, my party has split, I mean, there's no, part, there's no point sort of dressing it up. We are fundamentally split down the middle on Brexit. There is uh, little chance of that changing in the next uh, few months. The interesting thing is the one area that hasn't yet tested, been tested to destruction in this uh, discussion is the Labour Party. And so, conversely, a lot of the action in the next few months is probably going to be on the Labour Party side. It is going to have to be what happens with the Labour Party. You saw yesterday, supposedly 100 coming out for a second referendum, and in the end it only been 74, of which 29 were only, new, were only new names, so a number of MPs coming out for a second referendum. But the Labour Party is going to be an area of interest around this, and will be influential in where we head. 
Now, my background is not, as I say, in Brexit or trade. And, and I, if I'm honest, never went into politics on the basis of Brexit. I have much other, many other interests, economics uh, and, and, and the like. I had become increasingly exercised by Brexit for a number of reasons, one of which is a democracy <coughs> reason. Um, whether we like it or not, politicians chose the prospectus upon which we asked the people for a series of decisions. One was the alternative vote referendum in 2011, which everyone's forgotten about. The second is the Scottish independence referendum in Scotland in 2014. And this, and this is the latest one. This is the, the pan-British, you know, the, the real United Kingdom one. And if we don't deliver on it, I'm not trying to make political points here, if we don't deliver on it, we're going to have a problem in a number of communities around the country, including my own. And so there is a democratic issue with Brexit, and it's one of the things that has exercised me massively uh, since I got into Parliament. Having been somebody who had to think what he voted for when I had ballot paper in front of me, I did hesitate, I did go for leave in the end, but I didn't campaign for leave. I've never been some you know, swivel-eyed Brexiteer who spent 20 years um, getting, going for get rid of that EU. I, I, I did have to think about it, but I do fundamentally think, and a lot of us that do fundamentally think we've got a democratic problem here if we don't deal with this. Um, the second thing for me is, and I don't understand why this isn't discussed more, it's, as a historian, this is pretty clearly a pivot, and I don't understand why that is not recognised or understood. We are pivoting to a new model in a way that we pivoted to a new model in the 70s when we first went in. And if you read some of the books around when we went in, you know, there were exactly the same discussions about trade and about transition and about what we would have to do in terms of uh, uh, sorting out um, all the things which have been so eloquently discussed already. Um, we are pivoting again. Now, the only discussion is whether we're going to accept that pivot or whether we're going to go back to, you know, to the democracy point which I just talked about a moment ago. And then the third thing for me, just generally, is a question of sustainability. Because this, you know, I, have, I wouldn't dare suggest there was anything wrong with this, but this is, this is obviously fundamentally correct. And uh, there is, and absolutely, it is all the detail that we have to consider. And it's one of the reasons why we have such trouble at the moment, because it is immensely complicated. But the fundamental question for me on this, uh, on this whiteboard is, is this sustainable in the long run. And you will all have your own individual views on that. But my personal view is that, and where it has headed over the past 40 or 50 years, I hope it is sustainable for the good of everybody, including the United Kingdom and in Europe. But we can all see fundamental creaks to that model, uh, which either have to be fixed, in my view, by a semi-full political union, or a full political union, or, in the end, an alternative model. And I think it's the latter rather than the former, but that's for the European Union to decide. So, if you assume that there is a fundamental problem there with where that's going, then you can get, logically, whether you agree to it or not, to a place where you think we need to move somewhere else. And that's one of the reasons why I chose Brexit. So, in terms of the trade elements, for me, personally, if you take that as context, as somebody who is a Brexiteer, uh, but wants to, quote-unquote, make, make a success of Brexit. Um, I think there's some interesting questions on trade which are going to come for the United Kingdom in the next couple of years, and then much longer. We are going to go back, fundamentally, to a discussion about concepts and principles which we have not had to do for 40 years, certainly in my lifetime. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. There were, the six o'clock news was never led with discussions about tariff barriers. It was never led with you know, discussions about trade agreements. And we may, in the next 10 years, see more of that come to the fore. And I don't know whether the United Kingdom is ready for that. So I would say one of the interesting questions about trade is how we move that discussion to something which is more salient within our public discourse, which is more, which is more interesting and interested in with people in my constituency who didn't vote, you know, without caricaturing, without uh, caricaturing anybody, who didn't, didn't vote uh, to leave the European Union and stay in the European Union on the basis of trade policy. They voted for a number of other reasons, trade may have been an element, but that wouldn't have been the primary reason. But we are here now and we have a choice about what we do and we're going to have to have a bigger discussion about trade. So that's my first point on trade. The second point, I think, is part of that discussion is going to have to get away from this 
sort of caricatured uh, notion that we have moved into in this country about when we talk about trade policy. So um, I will be the first one tonight to talk about pollinated chicken because somebody no doubt will. We can always think, also include hormone injected beef, all of which you know, are very valid things to discuss. But if we're going to do this properly, if we get out, and I think we will get out, but if we get out in March or April, we're going to have to have a better discussion about what these things mean because we are our debate at the moment is caricatured in virtue signaling. You know, we, we pollinated chicken sounds terrible. It is scientifically fine. I'm not saying I would advocate it. I am not saying that I want it to be on our tables. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's necessary. But it is something conceptually which we need to talk about and we need to talk about in a much more reasonable way than we are doing. And then thirdly, we've got to decide whether we want to, to use a sort of truism or something that's um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, refuge of a politician. We've got to decide whether we want to take the opportunities that are coming for us or not. The, the point on trade is, if we're going, and if 90 odd percent of the growth in the next 10, 15, 20 years by the EU's own numbers is beyond the EU, it would seem logical to me at a conceptual level that we go after that. And if we are going after that uh, growth, we need to have the maximum number of tools and the maximum number of levers that we can pull to do that. And it's one of the reasons why I personally uh, I think that the two concepts which the Prime Minister has gotten wrong over the past few, uh, few months is the notion of frictionless trade, which I, I agree with Stefan to, to many extent, is, is not possible. Now that doesn't mean that we automatically default to the other position, that there is truckloads of, you know, Dover is just overrun by thousands of trucks that can't get through. But we have to accept the notion that we have to move away probably from frictionless trade as we know it. Now, we do semi-frictionless trade with vast numbers of goods elsewhere that come into our supermarkets on a, on a daily basis, so there is the possibility of doing it, but I think we have to get over that. Uh, because if we, through this withdrawal agreement, do give up on a substantial number of levers when we are talking about trade deals, and I know they've sort of hidden the common rule book in that 585 pages and they don't really talk about it anymore, but you can see the direction of it when they talk about the foundation for the future trading arrangements with the European Union being a single customs territory, which is customs union in all but name, uh, as far as we can see, that will effectively mean the common rule book come back, the levers of having a discussion about rules and standards with Australia, America, Canada and everywhere else will go, and therefore we will not be able to sign the meaningful trade deals that we hope want, would hope to do. So the Prime Minister is technically correct, we can potentially sign trade deals. The question is whether they are meaningful, and we've got to decide in this country whether we want them to be. So, as I say, not an expert on these things, but the key thing for me in this pivot, if we are going, is do we equip ourselves with the opportunity, do we look out for the opportunities that are out there, and do we equip ourselves with tools to take advantage of that? And that fundamentally is why I can't support the document, because I don't think it does either. Thank you. So if Stefan represents the ghost of Brexit past and Lee the ghost of Brexit present, I think I'm going to talk, I'm going to be the, the ghost of Brexit future. And specifically, I want to get started on the kind of discussion that Lee was just talking about in terms of looking past the events of the 29th of March and looking at what does a post-Brexit landscape in the context of Britain's international trade actually look like. And in particular, I want to focus on what I think will be a critical issue that has received virtually no airtime um, that will form the basis of a lot of those meaningful trade deals that Lee was talking about. So, one of the primary benefits that's been touted as being part of a hard Brexit, one where Britain leaves the EU without an exclusive uh, trade agreement with the EU, which based on the events this week seems like the most likely option at this point, is that Britain will be free to uh, engage in meaningful free trade agreements with other countries, so India, the US, Australia, and so on. While Britain is negotiating those agreements, the UK government and the people to whom that government is responsible will need to decide whether or not they accept the presence of something called Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanisms, or ISDS mechanisms for short. An ISDS mechanism can be crudely described as a provision in a treaty between two or more states that first gives investors from one state, let's call it the home state, 
certain rights when they invest in the other set. Let's call that the host set. For example, guarantees of non-discriminatory conduct between foreign investors and domestic investors, prohibition of uh, nationalisation of property, and so on and so forth. Second, and more controversially, ICS mechanisms give those investors from the home state a right to sue the host state for breaches of those rights. This litigation by the investor normally takes place in arbitral forums under rules and procedures that are set out as part of that ICS mechanism. Now this is a departure from the usual mechanism of dispute resolutions in treaties, which are generally done on a state-to-state -state basis. That is, no other parties, such as investors, can have standing to sue. What this would mean is that in normal circumstances, an aggrieved investor would need to go to their home state and get the home state to pursue remedies on their behalf. Where an ICS mechanism is uniquely different is it means the investor can sue the government of the host state directly without having to get the home state involved at all. Involved at all. Critically, and most controversially, sometimes the breaches which the investor is suing for arise out of changes in the, ho in the host state's government's public, po um, public policy, particularly their regulatory policy, where it's caused damage to the profit-making uh, ability of the investor. Britain is no stranger to ISDS mechanisms. Indeed, their origin is, a, is in a series of uh, arrangements called bilateral investment treaties, or BITs, to which Britain is party to over 94. But most of those BITs are limited documents that were signed by Britain in the 1980s and 1990s with various developing countries. The point of those BITs and the ISDS mechanisms within them was to provide certainty of investment between the two states and, the, and their investors. So say, for example, Britain and Kenya signed uh, a, 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 Brit a, bilateral, a, a bilateral investment treaty with an ISDS mechanism. If, Brit if British Petroleum opened a refinery in Kenya, and then Kenya nationalised that refinery and seized it, British Petroleum would be able to sue the Kenyan government for the losses it sustained as a result of that breach of the BIT. It wouldn't need to have Britain pursue remedies on its behalf. I should flag this is an oversimplistic characterisation of the way that ICS arrangements work, and indeed there are many controversial aspects to which I'll turn. But that's the general point of this, that the investor can sue the government of the other country in which they're invested. Critically, those ICS arrangements first arose in those bilateral investment treaties in the 1980s and 90s, but now they are generally part and parcel of much bigger and more comprehensive free trade agreements that are being signed across the world since the 2000s onwards, so since the 1990s and 2000s onwards. For example, ICS mechanisms are present in the North America Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between Canada and the EU, the currently stalled Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or the TTIP, between the US and the EU, and the initially doomed and now in part resurrected Trans-Pacific Partnership. Critically, Britain also, interestingly rather, Britain has some ICS arrangements with some countries inside the EU, mostly Eastern European states, uh, but a recent decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, Slovak Republic and Achmea, held that intra-EU ISDS arrangements uh, were incompatible with EU law. Although, ironically, when Britain leaves the EU, that will not work apply to Britain. Uh, the issue of these ISDS mechanisms, and in particular the political controversy that has attended them in other states, uh, has been exacerbated by the increasing frequency of claims and the increasing magnitude of those claims uh, over time. To date, there have been about 855 ISDS uh, so claims made under ISDS arrangements, but 65 of them alone were started in 2017. Uh, and by contrast, before 2002, there were less than 20 ISDS cases a year. Most of those claims are based on the old generation uh, bilateral investment treaties, uh, and to date, uh, British investors have brought 43 cases under ISDS mechanisms, and only two cases have been unsuccessfully brought against the UK. Uh, to give you a sense of the numbers involved, uh, claims on these ICS mechanisms range between 15 million to 1.5 billion, uh, and the median amount that uh, investors on these mechanisms tend to get is around $118 million.
Uh, I'll get to some examples of real life ICS claims shortly. Uh, but the important thing is that when Britain leaves the EU without uh, any uh, arrangement in place or some kind of a hard Brexit uh, arrangement and begins that process that Lee was talking about of engaging and negotiating these new meaningful free trade agreements with other countries, those pulling those levers, the British government will need to decide whether or not they accept the presence of these ISDS mechanisms in those trade deals. This is particularly pertinent because ICS uh, arrangements are quite controversial for a few reasons. The primary issue is that they are viewed as being a threat to national sovereignty by taking away the power of national governments to legislate in the people's interest, a criticism that sounds somewhat familiar. Somewhat ironically though, because the benefit of ICS mechanisms tends to go towards uh, large foreign multinational corporations, that criticism of ICS mechanisms tends to, oh, about the perceived lack of sovereignty, tends to come from the left side of politics rather than the, the right side. That's why Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's presently one of the leading uh, US presidential primary candidates, strongly opposed the United States ratifying the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2015, and in recent NAFTA renegotiations, supported the removal of ISDS provisions from NAFTA saying, and I quote, ISDS allows corporations to be given a free pass to ignore our rules and bypass our courts, a privilege not extended to millions of Americans living in this country. ISDS provides a huge handout to global corporations while undermining American sovereignty. So their concern is that a well-meaning government could pass laws that restrict the profit-making capability of a foreign corporate investor in such a way that breaches the treaty that contains an ISDS, uh, and that, the, and that therefore the threat of litigation from foreign investors could actually chill well-meaning uh, legislation with legitimate public interest at heart. So say for example, between 1995 and 1997, the Canadian government banned the export of a, of a chemical called PCB um, in waste, uh, which was purportedly to comply with their uh, international uh, obligations under certain environmental treaties. But a U.S. treatment company sued the Canadian government, sued the Canadian government arguing that the, the effect of the Canadian law was to discriminate against U.S. Uh, um, waste treatment services, which used PCB as opposed to Canadian ones which didn't, and that therefore it had a discriminatory effect. Uh, and they were successfully sued the Canadian government for uh, $20 million in damages. More recently, in Australia, uh, Australia has been the subject of to date unsuccessful claims under, uh, ver under various B BITs by tobacco companies. Because when Australia passed plain packaging laws, the tobacco company, uh, to uh, foreign tobacco companies who invested in Australia argued that that con constituted a unlawful uh, expropriation of their intellectual property in their branding. They've been unsuccessful to date. But those are the kinds of circumstances where you can see that claims are in, where claims under an ISDS start running up against uh, changes in public policy, particularly regulatory policy of governments. Interestingly, some commentators have even argued that the act of Brexit itself could found ISDS actions against Britain on behalf of investors who have invested in, on, the, on the assumption that by being invested in London, they would have access to the EU marketplace. Of course, one thing to get, to get after at the outset is a uh, a successful claim under an ISDS provision doesn't strike down the law or overturn it or render it incompatible or anything like that. It merely just provides a monetary remedy to the investor. Uh, so there's arguably no true threat to sovereignty, uh, merely just a financial consequence that needs to be taken into account in government decision making. The problem is, so goes the argument, that a lot of these ISDS, a lot of these treaties and the ICS provisions within them are, are worded very broadly, so it is difficult for governments to accurately plan for public policy because they don't know whether they're going to be subject of an ISDS claim or not. Uh, partly in response to these kinds of criticisms, uh, in the most recent uh, version of NAFTA, the recently negotiated USMCA, the ISDS provisions that were previously in NAFTA were pretty much stripped out and heavily weakened. Uh, the second controversial aspect of ISDS arrangements is the concerns about process, uh, specifically they take place in often confidential uh, commercial arbitrations. And the main criticism there is that these arbitrations are basically secret corporate courts 
where the arbitrators are much more likely to be friendly with the with companies that have a lot of practice in appearing in commercial arbitration as opposed to governments. Uh, that's why when there were negotiations between the EU uh, between the EU and the US um, you know, for the TTIP, there was an argument as to whether or not they should keep the like, ICS mechanism uh, with the EU pushing for a much more open and transparent uh, investment court system, which is basically an ICS but with more levels and a bit more open and transparent. Uh, now that arrangement is still being negotiated, um, and the US position to date is still in support of a traditional confidential ICS mechanism. Um, in fact, as recently as February of this year, uh, Jeremy Corbyn had, like, um, stated that the Labour government's position in ISDS arrangements uh, was basically in opposition to them, um, and that he was looking at trying to renegotiate a lot of those 1980s and 1990s bilateral investment trade deals to specifically strip out the ISDSs. Now, of course, putting aside the rhetoric of corporate courts, uh, the International Bar Association statistics show that, that uh, state governments tend to win these ISDS cases more than they lose, uh, and in any case, a third of these cases settle. It's also worth considering that if you didn't have an ISDS arrangement, the only option that a foreign investor who's been screwed over by this kind of investment, by these kind of actions, uh, would be to either rely on the domestic courts of the host state or rely on diplomatic pressure from the host state. Uh, this is all to say that the process of negotiating new free trade agreements after Brexit uh, is not an easy one. Even if everyone agrees in principle on the virtues of free trade, which itself isn't a given proposition. Rather, it seems likely that there will have to be a new debate uh, on the tr regarding the trade-off, on the one hand, between national sovereignty and, on the other hand, international commercial engagement is likely to take place for these various free trade agreements uh, in this new post-Brexit landscape. Uh, so one of the key issues being these ICS mechanisms. Moreover, Britain obviously won't be the only relevant party. It takes two to tango, and Britain's prospective trade partners are also trying to uh, get around, get their heads around what they think about ICS arrangements. Uh, it's unclear what the US position on ICS arrangements is ultimately going to be. Uh, in Australia, there is a back and forth between two main political parties, uh, with, with one party supporting ICS's and the other opposing it, and changing the government expected later this year. Uh, this uncertainty as to the future of these ICS mechanisms is something that Britain will necessarily have to get grapple with in coming years, even after Brexit has been determined. I'll leave with the parting observation that debates about ISDS mechanisms are generally poorly informed and, in my opinion, tend to overhype their relative importance. While the claims that are made under ISDS mechanisms uh, have increased in rapid scale over the last few years, they are still dwarfed in comparison to the size of the free trade agreements of which they are part. And it'd be a shame if the existence of the former ended up stymieing uh, the existence of the latter. Finally, this debate is a useful reminder that the, of the rhetorical importance of a perceived loss of sovereignty that can cause a storm in a teacup, and the rhetorical weight of that phrase uh, can problematise debates about international commercial relations, uh, and that seems to be a problem that will persist long after Brexit has been finally determined. Thank you. We now have a short time for the panellists to respond to each other's um, speeches to each other's discussion um, and for you to ask each other questions before we open questions to the floor. Uh, so, uh, I, one question I have for Lee, I suppose, is what would your view on the backstop be? Because you, you accepted that there'll necessarily have to be a shift to n no more frictionless borders necessarily. So if you're going to have a a harder border than there is. Is it better to have it between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, or is it better to have that border between Northern Ireland to preserve, the, between Northern Ireland and, and the UK, so you maintain that frictionless border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland to be consistent with the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the there are two challenges. One is frictionless trade, the second is the backstop, the main challenges. The, the question for me, and I probably say this as an ex-implementation consultant who spent 15 years in big four and banks trying to work out how to fix mining problems like this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I thought the remainders were coming to get me. Uh, uh, it was, uh, is that, the, is I don't see that they are irreconcilable. I think what we, I don't think the backstop is a necessity. 
I think the back, I understand the point it's an insurance policy, I understand the point it should never come into play. I, 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 am, I probably accept the principle that it may not come into play, uh, but that's a hope, right? I mean, you know, politicians aren't very good at hope and I don't want to play in that space. The problem I have with the backstop is the leverage that will be applied in order to avoid getting in there. And that is something which I think is uh, a real concern when we get onto the next stage of the agreement. If we have both the backstop hanging, uh, you know, backstop hanging about over us and all the leverage, there's nine billion and all the rest of it having been signed away. So the question is then, how do I reconcile that as a politician? Um, I, I just fundamentally think there is a solution. Uh, I, I am frustrated with this document and the exchange of letters between Juncker and the Prime Minister earlier this week saying we commit with urgency to look at solutions. Well, we've been doing it for two years, guys. Uh, I think we could probably have worked out some solutions by now. It is patently clear that a combination of checking at source, checking at destination, uh, technological AMPR type things at uh, the border, and a series of acceptances of the reality, Northern Ireland, for example, the overwhelming majority of goods crossing the Northern Irish border are either under the VAT threshold and therefore of nominal value for these kind of discussions or are moved by a small number of traders, which means that there could potentially be some form of trusted trader schemes. Now, I'm not here to sort of make up the solution tonight, but I know from uh, my, uh, my implementation days that there are enough leads to go on there that you would assume there is a solution. Now, I know that runs heavily up conceptually against some of the ideas and the discussions which we were talking about at the start of this discussion, but it depends which, for me, it's which start, which part of the conversation you start from. Do you start from the theoretical, there is a problem and I've got to solve it? If yes, you end up with the backstop. Or do you start from the practical, which is how do we solve it because everybody says that we can't get it to the place of having a hard border in all Ireland? If yes, you can find a solution and it is clear that there are solutions about. So I, I will do the politician's answer of dodging the question, but hopefully dodging the question on a reason, from a reasonable point of view. <clears throat> Anybody? A question to me? Can, can I ask you a yeah, question? Yeah, of course, please. Um, I, I've spent 15 minutes talking about why I think we can explain away some of these problems. Uh, and I wanted your view of why you, whether you think that that is reasonable or unreasonable, where the tension comes between people like me saying, it's fine, we can fix this, versus the conceptual problems which we will inevitably come up against. Um, Three short points. First of all, you say 90% of growth in the world is going to happen outside the EU, and that's why we need uh, these trade deals. Um, I agree with the first proposal. I agree to some extent with the uh, second proposal. But let's look at the whiteboard again. Now, our, our member states A, B, C, and D are of equal size. Um, U is also of similar size, and, and C is even smaller than any one of um, A, B, C, and D. Now, that is, of course, the model. The reality is that the European Union has 28 member states ranging from uh, 50,000 inhabitants to 82 million inhabitants. Um, once it comes to the question for which uh, level do we go when it comes to trade liberalization, who gives what in economic and industrial policy, size matters. Now, the EU at the moment has 550 million inhabitants. Britain will be 60. I wish you all the best. I'm not saying it's impossible, but there are difficulties. Um, and you better have thought about these in advance. Um, the second point, um, 39 billion you mentioned, um, I'm actually not um, what Heather made me out to be. I'm just a humble private lawyer and I teach um, company law in particular and I still uh, like um, partnership. Now there is um, section 35 and following of the Partnerships Act 1890, one of the jewels of Victorian legislation, says that the partners, every partner who leaves a partnership, remains liable for the debts that were incurred while they were a member of the partnership for five years after termination of the partnership. I'll leave it at that. The last point, um, when we talk about trade, I entirely agree, we should not overrate it. Let me quote a, a much humbler author than Tim Shipman. Uh, in the Journal of International Banking and Financial Law in May, I, I wrote this. <laughs> the, greatest, the greatest and most, obviously, um, most obvious opportunity of Brexit are not pie-in-the-sky trade deals, Singapore-style deregulation or whatever are the Eurosceptic Euro pipe dream. Please forgive me. <laughs>
It is rather that England will be forced to address its main socio-economic and constitutional weaknesses without being able to blame the EU for them, admittedly a pious hope. These weaknesses have nothing to do with the EU, but have accumulated in the course of the 20th century and accelerated lately. Educational inequality, failing utility markets, poor infrastructure, low productivity, a non-functioning housing market, as well as political and administrative over-centralization. If these remain unaddressed, and once European structural funds have subsided and integrated supply chains have been severed, large parts of the country outside London and the southeast might turn into one big Brexo giorno. Now, you from the Midlands, um, I hope that what I said there resonates with some of the frustrations that your electors perfectly legitimately voiced in the referendum. And allow me again to wish you all the best with addressing this catalogue, because that's where the real problems are. They are not caused by the EU. Leaving the EU will not solve them. You may find that those who have the highest hopes will, as they have been in the last 40 years, be the most disappointed. They are not losers from European integration, they are losers from globalization. The jobs that went in the Midlands, the jobs that went in the Northeast, in the Northwest, in the West of the country, went in all member states. What was different was the reactions in industrial policy, in social policy, in educational policy, in various other policies. None of this is intractable, but this is for the very, very long run. Do not expect this to be done in one parliament. We're looking at one generation, possibly two. I can, I can respond. Yeah, I, 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 I think that is... I agree with much of what you're saying, actually. I don't think this is a binary Eurosceptic, non-Eurosceptic uh, uh, axis which this needs to fall down. That's why uh, we're in the same political party. Uh, 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 I think the, the reality is we have a series of geopolitical um, existential problems which we are neither uh, sorting in this country nor sorting across Western liberal democracies. Uh, a, a issue of democracy as a whole, uh, an issue of a welfare state where we wish to, which we continue to wish to extend without actually having the ability to pay for it. We have a series of issues around debt, we have a series of issues around disconnection, we have a series of issues around uh, society being structured in a way where there is too much emphasis in one area, economically in the South East, for example, in the United Kingdom. That is a generational thing and it is immensely frustrating of me, uh, an immense frustration for me over the first 18 months of my political career, which may end quickly, uh, depending on uh, what, what happens in the next few months, but uh, the, the reality is that it's immense frustration with me that the quality of the debate down in London, we don't talk about any of these. If I can, without sort of going off too long, um, my, my, my constituency, which I grew up in and I was born in, or I was born 300, you know, four and a half a mile outside of, um, is a post-industrial ex-mining area which is immensely proud and actually underneath immensely you know, aspirational. And you know, if we're going to dinner later, I can wax a little about my towns because I genuinely do love it. It's a labour of love for me. Um, but we picked ourselves up in the 1980s after the miners' strike and put aside the politics of all that. We picked ourselves up when all the mines went and we took a punt. And we took a punt largely on logistics jobs because we are in the centre of our country. And next to the M1, we have great, great opportunities there. And there's about 25% of people in my constituency are, are in manufacturing or logistics. Now, I am immensely frustrated that the last two years, the first two years of my political career, and more importantly, the first two, the last two years for the country, have been obsessed with Brexit. It is important, it ma makes a difference, we've outlined why that's the case. But the thing that's gonna rip the heart out of my community in the next 15 years is artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, if we don't prepare for it. All of the jobs are going to go in logistics and manufacturing, or the vast majority are going to go. And I want us to get onto that conversation as quickly as possible. But we will not get onto that conversation, and I know this is a non-economic point, but we just won't get onto that conversation if we, if we screw democracy over in the way that I think we may head if we're not careful on Brexit. And I don't mean to be overly partisan tonight, this is not meant to be a, you know, a, a past political broadcast, but we've got to realise that for whatever reason, and I, I agree with you, the reason in many instances isn't the European Union, but for whatever reason people feel in communities like mine immensely disconnected 
from the discussions and decisions that are made not just in Brussels but in London and in the local council and in the county council and things like that and we've got to repair it and the first way, the first step on that is not to debate whether Brexit should happen, not to debate whether it's going to be a good or a bad thing, is for Brexit to happen and for us as politicians to make that happen and to make it happen in a way that, that, that works as best it can and, and, and to be positive about it and then we can start attending to some of those, those, those points. If Brexit goes wrong we, cannot, we won't even open the book on any of those points because we will lose millions of people around the country. We have eight minutes left, so at this point I'd like to open it up So my, my first question is, um, would you be able to draw the line on where your constituents would be willing to give up some kind of sovereignty in future trade deals? Because as I understand it, even if you quit the customs union um, and you negotiate some kind of free trade agreement, you will still have to relinquish some kind of sovereignty. So ultimately, one of the fundamental questions is going to be, where do I draw that line between what's acceptable and what isn't? I'm just wondering if um, some of your constituents have actually voiced anything on this. And I guess my follow-up question is more on that, this issue of you know, um, going, basically carrying on, because this is an issue that has to do with democracy. Um, does that mean then, in a sense, that if you um, quit Brexit, but come up with a solution that is extremely close to this, the amount of sovereignty that you relinquished under the customs union, but because you symbolically quit the, the customs union, this is sufficient, to respect this kind of democratic principle. And basically the silly question I can ask is, would it be perfectly acceptable to quit the union and then do another referendum six months later saying, should we join the union again? And everyone says yes, and that's it, basically, problem solved. And you, you just went through an entire symbolic um, process in order to get from square one back to square one, but in a sort of acceptable way. So basically that's my question. <laughs> I, I, I mean that. In, 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 as, I mean, I, I think the appetite for referenda in this country is, is, is severely diminished, uh, and I think we should keep it that way. I, I was an advocate of referenda back in the day. I think we've seen some of the challenges around referenda. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question, to be honest. The, the reality is 17.4 million people voted to leave and probably there were 17.4 million reasons for that. It's a bit of a silly thing to say, but I think there is some truth in that. Um, I, 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 I think many of my constituents have very strong views on this and many of my, I, I, uh, you know, they, they want power brought home, whatever that means. And again, the definition will, will differ. The, I think the reality is that this, there is something generally uncomfortable in the soul, without getting too existential, about power being too far away. And, that people, and you know, we can debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and all the rest of it. So there's a, there's a huge challenge around globalisation. I speak as a, somebody who is generally pro some of that agenda, about how that is articulated in the future. But the, the European Union battle has sort of been lost with that swathe of the country and therefore we sort of have to, to go there. So I don't, I don't know where the line would be drawn. But the, line, but the line has definitely been crossed on the current prospectus, so we will have to reset it by the way. Um, and I don't mean to sound flippant on that, I, I think you know, the, the, we, we have to move through this process, we, we can't play with people's lives or play with people's jobs, that is absolutely not what I'm suggesting, but we have to move through this process appropriately. Um, I don't think symbolism works, and it plays to the point we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is that I think my view is we're in a 30-year process here of trying to reconcile ourselves to some stuff that started in the 1980s. Um, and Brexit is a function of that, uh, but we're going to have to talk about globalisation, we're going to have to talk about democracy, we're going to have to talk about how we structure ourselves. I don't have the answers for that, it's not the topic tonight, but we, this is just part of that process and you know, the, 
we have to get through it in order to move on to the next stage. If I may briefly add, I'd also warn against referenda. Um, the problem is that in this country, sovereignty doesn't rest with the people, it rests with the crown in parliament. That's the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. It's not popular sovereignty. What we're seeing at the moment is a unresolved tension between the population asserting its will and the political system and the constitutional setup since the late 17th century not being in tune with that. Uh, having said that, I would warn against uh, referenda regardless of where sovereignty lies, simply because this country has a representative democracy. That's why you elect people and send them to uh, sit in parliament to have an enlightened debate. Um, without leaning too far out of the window, the referendum campaign in uh, 2016 was the PPI of British politics. The next referendum we'll have is about the death penalty, then the recriminalization of homosexuality, and, uh, and then the withdrawal of the right to vote from women. That's, these are topics, and let's not laugh about these, which populists all over the world are canvassing. We only have to look to Brazil, where a new, where a new president along these lines has just been sworn in. Hands off referenda, think about how to reform your representative democracy, in particular by strengthening the local autonomy that once existed, the great industrial cities of the north, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, all of them were once proud places running themselves. The current over-centralization in London, in Whitehall and in Westminster, did nothing for this country. We have time for one very short question. Hi everyone. Um, so a very quick question, I hope. Are we as a country going to be ready for a post-Brexit situation? Do we have the lawyers, you know, I think there's probably a few people in the room who are looking for jobs in the But are we actually set up as civil servants and please it's not doing a great job at the moment for negotiations with the EU? Can we be confident that post-Brexit, if it does happen, that the country will be will have all the resources to go back to a stage where we were 40 years ago and make all these trade agreements? So I'll, I'll just start. One concern that I have, and that I have, and, and understand as a problem that Britain might deal with, is that most other developed countries who have had, so the US, Canada, uh, Australia, who have had the uh, task of negotiating free trade agreements, have highly developed uh, departments of trade with lawyers, economists, who specialize in negotiating these kinds of uh, trade agreements the kinds of which Britain will need to negotiate in the post-Brexit um, situation. Uh, and, and we've got generations of those, so institutional support and resources for those kind of personnel. The problem is in that Britain, because Britain for the last uh, few decades has had to negotiate those kinds of arrangements because they've been negotiated at an EU level, is that my concern is that Britain will need to quickly upscale, upskill its trade negotiators, so as lawyers, um, economists, and so on and so forth, to merely have the institutional capacity to negotiate what are highly complicated uh, free trade agreements. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that Britain doesn't have the capacity to do so. Um, it's an incredibly uh, vibrant and resilient country, but that is something that we'll need to do. I think we are going to have to wrap up there. If anyone's eaten in Lincoln Hall, you know that the kitchen waits for no one. Um, but thank you for three fantastic panellists. I hope that we're leaving here a little bit more enlightened on trade law or the impact that trade law post-Brexit may have on the UK. Um, and also the scary fact that nobody, nor the people, the media, or the MPs in Parliament are actually discussing it at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much.